All right. Good morning, everybody. It is uh, <clears throat> January 26th, 2023. Another Ask Me Anything has begun. As always, I have curated the most upvoted questions from the private Facebook group as well as the BTWB Squads feature. And I think even just the top three might take a while to get through, so we'll see how it goes. We'll dive right in. Won't waste any more time. And that's that. As always, some really good questions. And as always, it's 5.45 in the morning here, so I'll be sipping some coffee. I apologize for the sipping sounds. All right, let's go. First most upvoted one is from Lisa D. <clears throat> she says, I thought I remember you mentioning in a recent video that you experience pain often, maybe even daily, as a result of quote unquote life and the different experiences that you've had. Am I remembering this correctly? I'm curious how you've learned to mentally balance the limitations that sometimes come with chronic pain and the desire to push beyond those limits when sometimes it's just not going to happen. Can you talk about the type of pain that you experience, how it affects your daily life, and how you've learned to continue CrossFit and not allow yourself to be mentally overwhelmed by it? People must like that one, most upvoted one. So, okay, sure. Uh, living with chronic pain is, it's really fun. It's just a blast. No, I mean, obviously not, but it is what it is, right? We all get dealt a certain hand and you play the hand that you're dealt. So the mechanism of injury for me personally uh, was a couple things. In the military bangs you up just as it is, even if you have a wonderful, boring career in the military, it's gonna bang you up. Um, I had a good accident in the military or about around the year 2000, so it's been a bit, where I broke my pelvis. I've got plates and screws uh, retained hardware in there to this day. Um, good morning from Amsterdam. Uh, that affects my pelvis, obviously, which I broke. That affects my hip on the right side. Uh, my right hip flexor is so tight from that day on that it's ridiculous. Um, and just my that happening to my hip flexor pulls on my low back, so I get some pretty good low back pain. It, it forever changed the tilt of my pelvis a little bit, which you're not going to just change something about your pelvis and not have it affect everything upstream, downstream, you know, north and south of that. So it affects posture, walking my entire spine, like it just throws everything off a little bit. So that, that in and of itself was enough to um, be my buddy for the rest of my life. Then on top of that, I made a really smart decision with some knucklehead friends of mine that we all got into sport bikes for a while in our life and had nothing to lose at that point in time in my life, no family or whatnot. And uh, we would try to go as fast as we humanly could on as many twisty roads as possible, well beyond our skill level and capacity. And it usually went well until it did not go well. And I had it not go well a couple times. I was a slow learner. I should have stopped riding motorcycles a lot sooner than I did. So I had a few wrecks on motorcycles, but one a significant wreck that I'm um, without question really lucky just just to be alive. Um, just, anyway, I mean, I'll tell that story on a different day, but very stupid, totally my fault, and wound up going into a ditch at around 60 miles an hour. I had on a helmet, but that was it for protective gear. Other than that, I had on a pair of Chuck Taylors, some board shorts and a t-shirt, and I got ejected and the EMTs found me about 70 to 80 feet from the motorcycle um, in a field. So that messed me up pretty bad. And the way that I, after I did my greatest you know, superhero impression of flying through the air after I got ejected from the motorcycle, I did kind of a half revolution through the air. And the first thing that hit the ground at that exceptional speed was the back of my head, my neck, and my upper back. And then, of course, it was just a vicious tumble um, till I finally came to a, a stop after that. So that, that just amount of exceptional blunt trauma <clears throat> to the back of my head, neck, and shoulders, it just forever messed 
it just forever messed them up. Uh, and to this day, I've got terrible range of motion in my neck, horrific. Uh, I've got just achy, creaky upper spine, neck, shoulder stuff that just doesn't happen. On a different motorcycle wreck, I blew out my AC joint. I uh, had a level five separation in my AC joint, which did heal up, but I had bad shoulders to begin with. And then a level five separation on top of that from motorcycle wreck didn't really do me any favors. So all of that, all of that wraps up into dumb things that I've done in my life uh, with my body. As far as the type of pain, uh, getting back to your question, I'm tight, but usually it's a, a dull ache most of the time is what I would say. I get sharp, intense pain occasionally, that's for sure. Usually in my leg, it, it's, it's linked to the pelvis, usually when I get very sharp, intense pain. And it just depends upon how that sharp pain is. It, it can and has sent me to the floor before, like my right leg will just, for lack of a better way to say it, just give out because I just happen to have my foot planted and I twist one way and it doesn't matter. It could be internal, it could be external rotation. There doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason that I can at least pinpoint to it. And if it's that day, it's, it's bad news and I might almost go down or catch myself on the counter or something like that. The neck is something I need to be really smart and careful with because if I push something too much or don't try to keep it loose or stretch it out, it will lock up and leave me with zero range of motion in my head, which is frustrating. And as I've said before, you know, my shoulders don't really allow my hands to go overhead very well without compromising my midline in a way that I don't feel is um, safe. And so that forces me to do a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of, um, modifications for going overhead. So with regards to what it does regularly, it takes me a while warming up to get below parallel because of what I've uh, done to my pelvis and all that. So warm-ups take me a bit, again, getting below parallel. It takes me a while to establish a front rack position and get my upper body and shoulders loose. And, and then even once I'm there, my front rack position is not anything that's gonna win any awards. It just, it is what it is. So it takes me a, quite a while to warm up into a eesh sort of position, but it's it's my front rack position, been working on it for years and it's just what I got. Overhead is hit or miss for me, depending upon the day. Uh, I found in general that dumbbells treat me a lot better than a barbell does. Dumbbells can allow one arm to maybe be a bit more out in front if that's what my shoulder feels like it needs to do, which is good. And I scale the loading a lot, but in general, dumbbells are my friend if I'm gonna be pressing overhead. Now, when I do press overhead, it's a good day if I can press the dumbbells overhead and push press them or whatever it happens to be. But quite often, if the workout involves pressing overhead, I'm gonna to have to modify that in some way, shape or form, press in a different direction, and that's okay. Again, I'm on my fitness journey, not on somebody else's. And for me, fitness is 100% still achieved, even if I have to press in a different direction. Um, let's see. So uh, but none of this stuff you would know if you just saw me walking around, at least I don't think anyway. I think I look rather normal walking around. And then the one thing that would probably jump out at your attention is if you saw me try to either put on my sock on my right foot or my shoe on my right foot. You would just stand there probably with a curious expression on your face and being like, what's wrong? What are you doing? And again, it's just from that right side where I busted my pelvis. That's um, getting my right sock or my right shoe on my, my right foot is a maximal effort, painful experience. Um, and so anyway, that's just my little friend that I have to deal with. My wife gets quite a kick out of it. I tell her at a certain point in my life, I'll need her to put my sock or my shoe on my foot for the remainder of my time on this planet. And then she tells me that I'm just going to have to figure it out is what her general response has been. So let's see. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I continue doing CrossFit, even given all this stuff, because, well, I almost struggle with that, with why I continue doing CrossFit, because, and this is not, you know, going, insulting your question or whatnot. Like, I just don't even understand why doing anything else would be an option, quite frankly. You know, we're all, we're all dealing with something, and... I'm going to live 
because of what I've done to my body, I'm going to live with certain chronic pain no matter what. It just, it is what it is. Um, and so if I'm going to have that no matter what, then in my simple reptilian brain, the choice is very simple. The chronic pain will remain. That's going to be permanent. Okay, so now I can have chronic pain and give up on CrossFit or fitness and have chronic pain while being weak, overweight, and frail. Or I can understand CrossFit, understand the methodology, understand that scaling and modifying is cool, replicate the stimulus to the best of my ability given what I have going on, and then I can have chronic pain and be fit and strong and have lungs and have the whole nine yards and keep as much range of motion in all of my joints as humanly possible because I'm embracing functional movements. And these functional movements are the ones that I'm going to need. Life demands that I go below parallel. Life demands that I deadlift, that I pick things up off the ground. Life demands that I run around. I got three kids. Life demands all kinds of stuff that aren't in general single joint machine based non-functional movements they're compound movements they're functional movements they're the stuff that we do with barbells and dumbbells and with our body every day in crossfit and so i actually don't see any choice other than maintaining but you know continuing on with crossfit because the the opposite would be a uh, a dark place of just losing functional capacity, losing range of motion, losing independent living sooner in, you know, in my later years sooner than I should. None of that sounds good. So the decision to keep doing CrossFit is, is simple to me, like, like totally simple. And I've seen people that have had similar injuries to me in the military and decided to, eh, I'm, I'm going to stop working out. And I've seen now years later, the condition that they're in. Mm -mm. I don't want any part of that. I'm here to tell you. I will happily deal with chronic pain, modify as needed, take a bit extra time to warm up. I will do whatever I need to do to keep walking my butt out into the garage gym every day and hitting the workout 100%. So, yeah. And I'll give you an example of a workout. So if the workout was grace, 30 clean jerks for time, 135 pounds for men, you know, I'll warm up, eventually get that front rack position, and no drama. Uh, my, my grace might look like 30 power cleans, and then when I'm done with the 30 power cleans, I'll go over to a flat bench and do 30 dumbbell bench press with a pair of 50s or a pair of 65s, depending upon how froggy I'm feeling that day. And that's my grace. I pressed in a different direction. It's all good. If I'm feeling extra good that day, then maybe I'll have a pair of dumbbells sitting on the side. I'll do 30 power cleans with the barbell, and then 30 push press with a, a lighter pair of dumbbells. 50s would probably even be, that'd be quite challenging, but possible depending upon the day. If not, I can always push press 35s and those feel quite good. And so let's be real, if I'm, if I'm push pressing a pair of 35 pound dumbbells, first of all, I've modified the workout, right? Instead of 30 clean and jerks, I'm doing 30 cleans and then 30 presses. A different workout than grace my goodness will, will i still be fit yes still be fit still keeping the stimulus even though doing that is going to take uh in generally speaking maybe a longer time domain that's okay it's okay we don't need to sweat it that much and if i'm pressing or push pressing a pair of 35 pound dumbbells overhead well the barbell is 135 a pair of 35 pound dumbbells are 70 so in all honesty those dumbbells are literally 50% half the actual prescribed weight that I'm doing in the clean. Again, this may really freak people out. They will feel like they're not doing enough. Oh, I'm doing this uh, scaled workout and scaling's a bad word and fitness isn't gonna be achieved. That's all nonsense. Utter and complete nonsense, malarkey if you will. It just depends on what's appropriately challenging for you. And for me, with what I've done to my body, push pressing a pair of 35 pound dumbbells is appropriately challenging i can promise you that and i can go heavier and then lock my neck up and not be able to turn my head for a week but that doesn't seem like a good call so 35s do the trick or i might do ring dips or i might do hand release push-ups or like i said i might do bench press but i'll press in some way and 
I have had nothing but great results. It hasn't stopped me from doing anything in the real world and, and life's good. And I'll keep that mindset for whatever the workout happens to be. What do I have going on? Listen to my body during the warm up. The warm up is an active thing that you're paying attention to your body. What kind of a day it's going to be? How does the load feel? How do the joints feel? And then I make the decision that I need to make. So that's that. Um, yes, I'm a human being. So getting back to your question, in the past, I have pushed beyond what would be smart or what I would recommend to other people from time to time. And sometimes you get away with a bad decision and sometimes you strain your neck and you go, ah, oh, I knew that was gonna happen. Why did I do that? Why? Like, it's, you know, we're all human, you know, uh, and, but I've, I've luckily have, have learned and I need to remember that I'm on my fitness journey. Like I said, I'm not on somebody else's fitness journey and that's okay. We can all do the same workout, whether it's Grace or DT or McGee or Fran, and we can all do the same workout. And if we talk about it, we understand what we're trying to get out of it. We talk about what each person has going on. We modify as needed, and then life's fantastic. So that's, that's that. Okay. Next most upvoted one from CW CrossFit. Okay. So... I'm going to summarize her question. So the first part she writes is, do the wheels need to come off now and again, or do you need to go to that dark place? And by the way, I'm not actually sure that I visited that dark place more than twice in seven years. So do the wheels need to come off every now and then, or do you need to go to the dark place to find that sweet spot of intensity? I hear you and Boz talk about, for example, how close you hold your hand to the flame. I'm making progress for sure, but I'm unclear whether or not there is uh, room for more improvement. She mentions some other people in the private track who have different approaches. Some people are full send individuals, you know, and at the end they're like, wow, that was too much. Some people, you know, feel it out and, and, and slowly go ratchet up the gears or the pace after that. So, you know, she says, let's see. Uh, I rarely seem to get to the place that I often see other people talk about. Uh, for example, Fran Lung, laying on the floor, etc., etc. I would say that generally I feel good after a workout. And within a minute or so, I'm able to clear up my kit and go home. No bleeding lungs, no rolling around on the ground. So I wonder whether I'm uncomfortably safe and not pushing as hard as I should on my intense days. Fantastic question. Awesome question. So there's a couple things here. You already told me everything that I need to know, which is you said, I'm making progress for sure. Done. Question's over. You're good. Drive on with your life. Have a great day. You know, could there be some more on the table? Maybe. Maybe. But, you know, one of my biggest questions would be, are you making progress? And then if the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, we dive into a lot of things. Intensity is just one of them. How's your sleep? How's your nutrition? Those are probably two of the bigger ones, quite frankly. Are you biasing your training? Are you cherry picking workouts? Are you avoiding your weaknesses? There's a whole bunch of things we would go down, but intensity would be one of those things. And intensity is without question important because although it's an oversimplification, intensity is a significant factor in driving results without question. And this also goes down you know, another rabbit hole why more is not better because the more things you lump onto your plate, you're a human being, you only have so much energy and intensity to give that if you're doing part A, B, C, and D, by its very definition, you're probably not doing things intensely. Now, luckily, I know that's not the issue here at Lynchpin, right? Like we understand the death by volume is not a good long-term strategy for anyone's knees, back, shoulders, or intensity and results. So I know that's good. Now, this is also talking about regular people like all of us, not games athletes. You know, they have a slightly different needs because, you know, sometimes you'll see a games athlete like back when regionals happened or the games or something like that, and some workout that's a similar stimulus to something they've done in training, 
lays them out on the competition floor and they are decimated in a way that a similar stimulus has not happened during training. Similar amount of reps, similar movement patterns, similar loading, the whole nine yards, similar time domain. Well, why did it have such a different impact? Well, because in competition, they went a whole heck of a lot harder in that environment at a whole higher level of intensity and that same stimulus wrecked them because they had not exposed themselves to that level of intensity on a regular basis and now that same workout is an entirely different experience and it could be just because they neglected that or it could be because it's really hard to replicate the intensity that you're going to feel under the lights with the crowd with the competitors next to you you know you just tend to go a bit harder and that produces a different experience so if you are you know like a competitive athlete in that realm you need to find a, a way to expose yourself to what will be almost like a competition sort of level of intensity because if you don't and you go into competition you do that and you haven't been doing it you're going to be decimated in a way for the upcoming events that other people won't be if they have been gradually exposing themselves to that. I hope that makes sense. That's also, now I'm a bit of a rabbit hole, sorry. That's also what's interesting about the Open. Open's a fun, the CrossFit Open's a fun community event. There's nothing magical about Open workouts. They're not extra hard. They're not. People have this thing in their mind of, like, oh my goodness, do you remember Open Workout, whatever, it was so terrible. There's nothing crazy about an open workout. What happens is people go extra hard on those workouts because they have created in their mind this thing that it is something different and unique and more than my normal training day and I'm going after it. And then a similar workout, similar movement patterns, similar loading, similar amount of volume, all those things it hits them in a way that it normally hasn't because the only variable that they change is today, they went bonkers on the workout in a, in, a, in a bonker level that they don't normally go. And then the workout feels different. So the question, getting back to what CW CrossFit asked, do you need to do that, that level of intensity? Like after the workout, I'm hyperventilating, non-communicative, got to kick my shoes off, my legs are doing some crazy dead cockroach thing, just feel like a truck hit me, lungs are on fire, I'm not ambulatory. Do you need to do that in order to get really fit? No, you do not. No, you do not. Okay, so hopefully that helps also set the stage between, you know, the recreational athlete, if you will, living everyday life, you know, prepared, general physical preparedness versus competitive CrossFit, the whole nine yards. So I'm not talking about competitive CrossFit. But in regular CrossFit, intensity still does help garner results. So you do need to push yourself. But again, that doesn't mean maximal effort. So let's see, make sure I get back on track here. You know, we define, you know, we say that intensity is a relative thing based upon the individual's physical and psychological tolerances. So what's intense for you may or may not be intense for somebody else, and that's okay. You're on your fitness journey and your path. There's a, a funny saying that although it's not perfect, okay, so don't take it as, as law. It is just that a fun saying, but I think it gets the point across with your question of do I need to just have these 100% crazy, crazy efforts? No. And the, the saying is, a lot of numbers coming here, 80% effort, 100% of the time, will get you 90% there. I can't remember who said that, but I think it's really uh, clever and funny and accurate, so I'll say it again. 80% effort, 100% of the time, will get you 90% there. And so point being, if you're going like 80%, and I even wouldn't recommend doing that every day, but you know, if, if a couple times a week, you know, you're hitting it about 80%, that's high intensity. It's not moderate, it's not low intensity, I'm here to tell you. And if you're doing that on a regular basis, it's gonna darn near get you to the finish line. You're gonna get, like I said, 80% effort, 100% of the time, will get you 90% there. And so that point is, are you maybe leaving a little bit on the table? Because it said 90% there, so there's another 10% there. Maybe, but again, this is 
this is just a fun saying, okay? These are just fun sayings. But it's going to do wonders for you. And so if that's the life that you're living, you are crushing it. You are fantastic. And if you never did that little extra, you know, Fran Lung crazy push, I think you're gonna be just fine. Is there value to doing that every now and then? I personally think yes. I personally think that there is. Another important thing to say is that nothing in what I'm saying should ever be taken as training recklessly, moving recklessly, moving unsafe. Nothing of that should ever, ever come into play. What we're talking about, the kind of the basis of this question is finding your threshold, your limit. How do you know where your limit is? Well, you find it by bumping into it and either getting knocked back on your butt or pushing through it. But if you never bump into your limit intelligently um, in a safe environment, in a controlled environment, then you'll never know where your limit and your threshold is and maybe what you're truly maximally capable of. And again, you could get really close to your limit and never bump into it and be amazingly psychotically fit for your whole life and be great. But, you know, you want to find out what that is, you got to bump into it. And it's strength and conditioning. Again, nothing unsafe, nothing reckless is no different than many other things in life, which we used to give examples for this. Driving, playing music, shooting, you know, like I've got a military background, so shooting always made sense to me when I try to explain this to people. Is if I have somebody in training shooting at a target and all of their rounds are just one right on top of another, beautiful, like a super tight group, flawless, then they need to start shooting faster, right? Because they're within their comfort zone. No matter how fast they're shooting, if they're shooting that tight, they're within their comfort zone. If I look at their target and there are bullet holes all over the place, it's not, it looks like they shot a shotgun at the target instead of a pistol or a rifle, then what I'm going to tell them is, you need to slow down. You're shooting, I don't care if it took you an hour to shoot that, you're still shooting way too fast. You're shooting beyond your capacity level. And so what I want to find is that wonderful balance where it's a pretty tight group and you got one or two flyers out of there. Great. You're operating probably really close to your threshold of how fast you can do something and still do it well. And that's going to be where we're going to have people with strength and conditioning as well. So when I say, you know, same with driving a car, you drive it safe, race car drivers drive too fast, you go into the wall. They want to come as close as they can to just using the entire track without going off the track and hitting the wall. It's the same thing with strength and conditioning. Now, when these little errors that should pop up, if you're trying to find your threshold, again, are not safety things. It's if we're going back to our grace example, it's you start to pull the clean a little bit early with your arms. You get a little bit of an early arm bend because you're trying to go a little bit faster than you should. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about some crazy degradation of your spinal column. You get the bar in the front rack position and you had a quarter extremity violation on the jerk. You know, you started to press early, you know, before you fully opened up your hips to push yourself back under the bar. Well, you're moving a little bit fast where you are. We're going to give you some cues and slow you back down and find where you can ride that line where you're doing something technical and challenging and you're doing it quickly and you're doing it well. And you don't generally find out where that is without kind of experiencing those speed wobbles from time to time and the tightening it back up. Again, nothing crazy, nothing dangerous, nothing reckless. Just, you know, everyone finds their, their limits a little bit. So, so that's about that. So hopefully, hopefully that, hap uh, that helps. Okay, final most upvoted question. This is from Zach G. Okay, so Zach says, it seems to me that you are very, uh, anyway, motivated, driven, committed, etc. Thank you for your kind words. What keeps you going forward day in and day out? What are some of your motivations that help you stay consistent, internal or external motivations? On a side note, what sort of coffee do you drink? Is it a drip or do you grind your own kind of beans? Well, the coffee question is easy. So I drink black coffee 
and I used to do the whole bean grinding thing, but then I got lazy and I don't think my palate is that sophisticated, quite frankly. And so now we've got a, a drip coffee machine that, you know, just hit up in the morning, click it, it's good. And I just drink black coffee and, and life is fantastic. So for your other questions, and, and this is a question that comes in, in many different forms from various people, because I think people are always looking for some sort of hack or something, you know, to get accomplished what they want to accomplish help with their motivation, um, help being committed to a certain goal and getting to the finish line and all that stuff. I don't have any secret tips on that. I don't have any motivational catchphrases that I um, tell myself every day or any mantras or things like that. I don't have any explicit like self-help motivational books to recommend or whatnot. You know, the books that I do read, I, I do think are I do think help keep me on the path, if you will. And I, when I do have the time to read, which I enjoy very much, it's generally nonfiction. And it's nonfiction about somebody that did something hard and challenging in the world. And I, I find value in that and in seeing other people's discipline, dedication, and struggle and how they persevered. And, I, you know, people have been through things a whole heck of a lot harder than most of us have ever been through. And so it's helping learn from those shared experiences I find helps drive me forward. So the books help. But other than that, uh, you know, I think one of the greatest things I would say helps keep me on track, committed on days I don't want to do things but still do them is the same is the same thing that caused my life changing injury. It's the military. Um, and it's funny because I got a, a another question was about the helmets that are on the wall behind me and what are the helmets, what do they mean, what are the numbers on the sides and all that kind of good stuff. And it's all kind of related. I, I attribute my time in the military to being profoundly formative and instrumental in helping, I guess, make me into the person that I am or whatnot. It was certainly at that time in my life the hardest thing I, that I'd ever done without question, requiring the most discipline, focus, motivation, all of that stuff. And that I do really think helped set a path for me forward. So I, I had a lot of good experiences and a lot of bad experiences in the military. And But, and, you know, got an injury that changed the rest of my life. However, that being said, I would do it all over again, even if I had to have all the both the good and the bad happen period end of story just because i i think it did help make me into the person that i am and i don't know where else i would have gotten that experience quite frankly or been around the group of individuals i, I was around so that's that's my short answer to that you know the helmets on the wall again they're linked so those are from when you go through buds which is seal school you get helmets i guess you can't see all of them maybe i'll tilt the camera a little bit there's a green one there too. So there's three helmets. The every phase. Green is first phase, blue is second phase, which is dive phase, and then red is third phase, which is the land warfare phase. The number on the side is your class number. I was 215. And then you've got a stripe on your helmet if you're an officer, aka cake eater. And the stripe on the helmet is useful because the you know, the enlisted guys will have their petty officer or whatnot, they'll have their, their stuff on their helmet, but just the officers have a stripe on their helmet. And that's useful because even at a distance, the instructors can see who the officers are and then make our lives extra miserable. So that's really helpful for them at a distance to just, you know, bring great discomfort upon us. <laughs> so anyway, that's that. But things I learned from the military, quite frankly, you know, we could do a whole big, long podcast on that, but I'll keep it short. Um, it's just do your job. Do your job. Do what is needed. You don't, don't do what you want. Do what is needed. And those are two different things. And nobody cares. Nobody cares if you want to do your job or nobody cares if you don't want to do your job. Your thoughts and feelings are irrelevant you do your job, period, end of story. You get up in the morning, you say, what has to get done? And that's what you do. Not what do I want to do, what has to get done? And you do that. And I learned that in the military, there wasn't any really other option as well. And that's not to say, heaven forbid, that you know, your thoughts and feelings and wants don't matter. 
that's that's for sure. But if there's other stuff that has to get done, you do what needs to get done first. And then if you have time left over, then you serve your own personal wants or needs, but not first. And I think that's a really, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but sometimes I think that's lost uh, these days. And you not only do what is required and you do your job, whether you want to or not, you just do it. But even if you finish your job, you then don't go right to your needs next. That's another beautiful thing that I learned from the military. You do your job, you do what is required. Then once you finish your job, you then ask all of your buddies if they need help with anything that they're doing. It doesn't matter if it's a miserable task or a simple task. Ask everyone else, do you need help? Do you need assistance? Because, hey, I'm done doing my thing. I've got some time. And if somebody needs help, then you don't do whatever it is you wanted to do. You help that person. And then when you and that person finish that task, you guys aren't on free time. Both of you then walk around to try to find somebody else and say, do you need help? And you play this game over and over again for as long as it takes until you know confidently that not only are you done with your task, but all of your teammates are done with their tasks and no one else needs help. Then you're on your own time. Only then. And you might be in the middle of being on your own time and then something else pops up. And then guess what? Your time's now over and you get back to work. And you repeat that until everything's done and then you're back on your free time. So that, I know that sounds really simple, and it is really simple, but it's, it's simple, not easy, right? Because it's the couch is really inviting and Netflix is really inviting. And there's a good chance it's sitting on the couch and watching Netflix, there's something undone. And I credit the military with giving me at least the discipline to not sit on that couch if there is something undone. Do whatever it is, do as long as it takes, and hey, I'm sorry if it takes you until bedtime and you didn't get any free time that day, you didn't get any free time that day. You know, you did what you needed to do, what your job needed, what your community needed, and what your family needed. And hopefully it left you with some free time, but not necessarily. So yeah, selfless service and being part of a true team, um, being part of something bigger than yourself. That was some of the larger things I think that helped me to this day that I walked away from the military with. And God bless the SEAL teams for this. I'll tell you what, there was no motivational speeches and training from our instructors. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. Nobody cared if you quit. Nobody was going to give you a rah-rah speech to stick around. You stuck around because you decided to be there, or they were more than happy to help walk you to the bell so that you could quit. More than happy, and they would not try to talk you out of it. So. I think there was some resilience built in that as well. Now, don't don't get me wrong. That's the instructors. Within the class, you know, your teammates, we would very much be encouraging to one another, tell each other, don't do it. You know, I know it sucks right now. I know the water's so cold. I know the night is so dark. I know you're shivering so bad, and we're going to be in this water all night long and all night tomorrow night, and all night the next night for months and months, and you just want it to end. But don't. Keep your arm locked to my arm. Don't stand up. Don't walk towards the light. Don't give in. Like, you know, we would encourage each other, but the instructors, there's more, I mean, they were trying to encourage you to, to quit, you know? Warm blankets, hot coffee and donuts here in the ambulance, gentlemen. Just stand on up and come on in. This can all be over right now. Why are you doing this to yourself? Get warm, get cozy. You don't have to live this life. And so developing the ability to drown that out and focus on what you actually needed to do was very helpful. And so again, I, I, I credit that uh, a lot with that. And also what I think helped from the military was, you know, people see a lot of the flashy stuff you know, an explosion, a door blows off the hinges, guys run into a room on night vision with lasers, blah, 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 blah. True. But what they don't see is the embracing of the non-sexy, non-flashy stuff that leads to that, the fundamentals. 
So another thing I learned in the military is how important the fundamentals are. Do the basics, do the fundamentals, and do them really, really well. And then once you have that incredible foundation built, you can do more advanced stuff off of that, but it's a curse to try to rush into the advanced things before you have built that profoundly solid base. And that's the same in CrossFit, and that's the same in, in so many other things. And so I think that was very uh, beneficial as well. So yeah, I think that's probably it. So that's a good one. I'm looking at my baby monitor and my little girl just woke up. So probably a great time to, to sign off. Hope everyone has a great day. Enjoy your rest day. I know that I'm going to enjoy mine. Be kind to one another and we'll talk again later.